My name is Sean, and I'm 28 years old. A few months ago, I was checking out Craigslist, and I saw a really nice cell phone, an even nicer price. I contacted the seller immediately, and we arranged a meeting. The transaction was very fast. We met at a particular street. The guy who sold it to me was about 40 years old, pretty normal and average looking guy. He was polite and allowed me to test the phone. It was working perfectly, and although it was used, it looked brand new. Thanks, I'm glad I got this. Great deal, I said as I left. Thank you, take care, the man replied as we shook hands like two gentlemen who sealed a business deal. I live with my girlfriend, Doris. One night as we were sleeping, my new phone started to ring. It was 3 a.m. <clears throat> Damn, who could that be? Hello? I mumbled, still cranky from being awakened by the noise, answering the call but trying to snap out of my sleep. At first, there was no answer from the other side, but then a strange noise was produced, and after that, a scream. So loud that I actually dropped the phone, being caught by surprise. What the hell? I picked up the phone again, but the call had been terminated. Who was that? My girlfriend asked. Uh, I don't know. I got a call from an unknown number. I heard a piercing scream and I got scared. Uh, I don't know, probably a stupid prank. I'm going back to sleep, I said to Doris. Yeah, we should just turn off our phones while we're in bed, Sean. People are allowed to rest. Agreed. Everything was normal after that eventful night. I took my girlfriend's advice, and any time we wanted to be alone, we just turned our phones off. I didn't even take it to the bedroom anymore. Instead, I just placed it on a shelf in the living room. Yet, one night, the cell phone rang once again. I looked at my watch and realized that it was precisely the same hour as last time, as the same anonymous call at 3 a.m. This time, I was home alone, since my girlfriend was visiting her sister for the weekend. It was Saturday night, and I was genuinely freaked out. I went to the living room and picked up the phone. Again, it was an unknown number. I wasn't very hopeful about getting a proper answer, but still. Hello? Who is this? I asked. Someone was speaking at the other end, but the words were very distorted. It sounded like someone was in fear. I felt a sense of dread and terror from the other side. I don't understand. I can't hear you properly. Please speak loudly, I asked, feeling a natural instinct of solidarity, as if that person needed my help. The person spoke again and again, repeated the same thing. It was an address. I wrote it down. What do you want me to do? I asked, with my hands shaking. I got a simple answer, coming from the distortion and the feeble voice. Search underground. After hearing these words, the phone call was ended. This is just too weird. I said to myself as I sat down on the couch. I kept looking at the address, and it was from a town not far away from where I lived, probably an hour's drive. I got dressed and had a cup of coffee. You might call me stupid, but I'm a very inquisitive person, so I knew I had to go visit that address. I couldn't just wait. It was like my sixth sense was in control now. I drove there as fast as I could, and within 45 minutes, I arrived. It was a big house in a very quiet and small street. There were other houses nearby, but they appeared to be abandoned. But not from the one address. There was a car parked inside the garage, and I could see lights on inside the house. It was now 5 a.m. Okay. I'm here. Now what? I said to myself, trying to think 
before remembering the additional words from the voice. Search underground. There was a big garden attached to the property. That was a start. Suddenly, I got a text message from an unknown number. The words said, Dig behind the garage. You'll find a shovel inside. I climbed the wall and was now inside the property. I followed the instructions of the eerie anonymous text. Trying to be as silent as possible, I picked up the shovel, which was indeed inside the garage, and now I was digging behind it. After a while, I found something. A human head, still composing. I couldn't help but scream. Bad idea. Within seconds, someone came from inside the house. Hey! Who's there? What are you doing? Come here! A man screamed, and I was surprised to see that it was precisely the man who sold me the cell phone. I was now running like hell towards my car. Another individual appeared from the house. I was now being chased by both of them. Fortunately, I was empowered by the adrenaline. Plus, I still managed to throw the shovel at them, which at least forced them to stop, avoiding being hit. I drove back as fast as I could, parking near the closest police station, and as expected, my chasers didn't follow me. I ran inside the police station and explained everything. The corpse buried in the garden, and the men who lived in the house who tried to stop me from revealing my findings. Within hours, the police captured the men. They were criminals, robbers and murderers, organized and experienced. The cell phone that I bought from one of them was a stolen item, and I was shocked to know that the person that I found dead, buried, was actually the owner of the same cell phone, a woman named Monica. I returned the cell phone to the police, of course. As for those mysterious phone calls and the text message, I guess I'll never know for sure who it was. But given all the circumstances in which those contacts happened, I do believe that it was Monica's spirit before crossing over, trying to warn me about the killers so that Monica could have peace. I'd been working as a sandwich artist at Subway for the last two years. It wasn't the highest paying job, but my boss Dave had been great about working around my class schedule, so it seemed like the best option for me before I graduated. I usually worked evenings, meaning the hours were slow, especially right before we closed at 10. That was the time we'd get really sketchy people, often homeless men who'd finally scrounged enough money to buy a six inch. Occasionally, guys would come in who were very clearly tripping on you know what, and I'd have to treat them very carefully. Because I was always the only worker there, my mother often worried that something bad would happen. She begged me to get a safer job, but I always told her everything was totally safe, and I genuinely believed that too. This all went down a few hours ago. I was 30 minutes from closing up and I hadn't had a single customer in over an hour. We had rules against using our phones during work hours, so I had to just stand there and wait. I guess I was zoning out because I didn't notice the man walk in until he was standing right in front of the counter. He was in his 20s, a few years older than me, and jarringly handsome. Tall, muscular, dark eyes that seemed to bore into me. He looked like a movie star. I asked him what he wanted and instead of answering my question he said, You're all alone here, huh? It was such a strange thing to say but I didn't feel scared, not yet anyway. I guess that's how it goes. Beautiful people like this guy could say whatever creepy things they wanted and never strike the wrong nerve. Again, I asked him what he wanted. He smiled and ordered a tuna sandwich. As I went through the typical questions, what size, what kind of bread, he reached into his pocket and pulled out a small black object. I didn't recognize it until he held it up and started staring at it. This was a taser. One of those things that policemen use to shock people. What are you doing? I asked. He didn't answer my question. 
instead listing off all the vegetables he wanted on the sandwich. He didn't look at me, just staring at the taser as if it was the most fascinating thing in the world. I didn't move. Fear coursed through me, and it was like I had no control over my body. My arms hung uselessly at my sides. Did you hear me? He asked. I said I wanted tomatoes. When I still didn't move, he stuck the taser towards me. Have you ever felt 50,000 volts course through your body? I haven't, but I'm sure it's not pleasant. What do you want? My voice sounded so high-pitched, so weak, I could barely breathe. Tomatoes and lettuce, he shouted. And then he laughed. <laughs> and I want you, Tracy. <laughs> Hearing this lunatic say my name out loud felt like the worst possible violation. It felt wrong. I had a name tag, so customers sometimes called me by my name, but it didn't happen often, and it didn't feel like this. Then I realized that I wasn't wearing my name tag. Somehow this psycho already knew who I was. Who are you? I asked. By that point, I had regained some control over my body. I inched backwards. No one, he said. Then he smiled slowly. You know, this is a pretty dangerous part of town, especially this time of night. He moved the taser closer. A pretty girl like you? You shouldn't be here. Don't hurt me, I said. I'll give you everything in the register. He shook his head. No. He didn't move for the longest time, just waiting with his weapon outstretched. One side of his mouth quirked upwards into a smile. Then he lowered the taser. Actually, I don't want a sandwich anymore. See you around, Tracy. He turned to leave, moving slowly, casually. A normal person would have raced into the back room, locked the door, and called the police. That's what I should have done. But something came over me in the moment, complete and total anger. I'd never been threatened like that before. I never looked danger in the face. Before I realized what I was even doing, I grabbed one of the sandwich knives from the counter and raced after him. In seconds, I tackled him to the ground. I screamed something at him, right in his face, but in the excitement of the moment, I don't remember what I said. As he fell, the taser skidded out of his hand. He struggled to get free, but I held him down. His legs kicked under me, but I wouldn't budge. I pushed the knife against his throat. Who are you? I screamed into his face. What do you want? Stop, he begged. His eyes welled with tears. Just seconds ago, he looked like a psychotic killer. Now he was bawling like a baby. Still pressing the knife against his skin, I reached over and grabbed the taser. When I held it in my other hand, I realized that it was a fake. It was a toy. He jerked to the side, trying to get away, but in that movement, my knife accidentally cut into his throat. I saw blood oozing out. He started to choke. Who are you? I said again. Your, your mother, he spurted. Blood was coming out of his mouth. What? My mother? Your, your mother b b paid me to scare you, he sputtered. She, she wants you to, to quit. She, she wants you to find a safer job. I, I'm just an actor. More blood oozed out. Instantly, I jumped off him. I stood over his twitching body as he held onto his neck. I called 911, of course, and then told him to send an ambulance right away. It took them five minutes to get there. By then, the man had lost a lot of blood. I'm at the police station now, and I have no idea how to explain what happened. I guess I'll tell them the truth. I'll tell them that I didn't mean to slash that man's throat. But who knows if they'll believe me. You believe me, don't you? You know that it was all just an accident, right? My roommate moved out in January, and I'd been looking for her replacement ever since. I live in the LA metro area, so I had assumed I'd be able to raise the rent just a bit, even though I'm not in the nicest neighborhood. I figured I'd be able to find someone pretty quickly, but after two months... I still hadn't found anyone who would be interested in renting the room. I'd tried practically everything, but I hadn't used Craigslist. 
Honestly, I'd completely forgotten that Craigslist even existed. Beggars can't be choosers, of course, and I really needed the money. So I uploaded a few pictures of the apartment and added a post in the Housing Wanted section. Honestly, it took me no more than 10 minutes. I had no idea how that single post would change my life forever. In less than an hour, I got my first response. A message came in from a man who introduced himself as Johnny. I'd never had a male roommate before, but his message seemed really nice. More importantly, he agreed to the full amount. So after a short exchange, I gave him the address and invited him to come over. He arrived right on time, which I took as a good sign. My first impression was that he was an artsy hipster type. He even had a goatee. He was extremely handsome and very polite. I invited him inside and gave him a quick tour of the place. He stopped in the kitchen and asked if there was anything off limits. I explained that he couldn't eat my food, but the appliances and utensils were free to use. I had a block of high-end knives left by my last roommate, a chef. He stopped in front of them and pulled out the biggest knife. Including these? He asked. Sure, of course, I said. He smiled and slid the knife back into its slot. I didn't think anything of it at the time, but the look on his face as he held that knife should have been my first warning. Johnny moved in that weekend, and we had our first dinner together. We talked about movies and TV. Just unimportant stuff. It seemed like we had a lot of things in common, though. I had a good feeling about him. After about a week of him living there, we got pretty close. We usually ate meals together and watched Netflix. Then one night, right after I came home from work, he said, Hey, Melon, how was your day? I started to answer, but the words caught in my throat. It took me a few seconds to register that he'd called me Melon. That was my childhood nickname, but no one had called me that since third grade. How could Johnny have known? What did you call me? I asked. Madison, he said. That's your name, right? But I knew what I heard. I looked into his eyes very closely. Did he look familiar at all? Had I ever met him before? Was he some long-ago classmate that I'd forgotten about? No, he didn't look familiar. And that name, Johnny. I didn't remember any Johnnies in my elementary school. He smiled and told me that he'd already cooked us dinner. I shook the doubts out of my head and sat down to eat. He told me some stories about his work, and I very quickly forgot about the weirdness. But then, as I was doing the dishes, I looked over and saw Johnny watching me. He pulled at the hair behind his ear, and I instantly recognized that gesture. There was a boy in my first grade class who used to do that, Jonathan Mayers. He was from a poor family and he often came to school with dirty clothes. Back then, all the kids had been really mean to him, me included. Are you Jonathan Mayers? I asked him. A sad smile stretched across his face. You finally remember, he said. Why didn't you say something, I asked. He laughed. Like his smile, it was cold. Do you remember the teddy bear? He asked. I shook my head. I had no idea what he was talking about. The teddy bear! He started to scream. The navy blue teddy bear! Damn it, Madison! You have to remember that! I tried really hard, but I still didn't know what he was talking about. I gave it to you on Valentine's Day, he said. First grade, I saved up all my money just for you. Oh, I said. How sweet. He was still inching closer. And do you remember what you said? I honestly didn't. You said I probably got it out of the dumpster, he screamed. And you threw it out of the window. Of course you wouldn't remember that. Of course you wouldn't even recognize the boy that you terrorized for an entire year. He passed by the block of knives and casually pulled one out of its slot. Johnny, I, I said, what are you doing? When I showed up at your door and you didn't recognize me, I thought this would finally be my chance to get revenge. But then you were so nice to me, and I started to forget all that anger, all my years of therapy. I thought you'd changed, but nope. You're still the same, selfish, conceited girl from elementary school. Put down the knife, I told him. 
He dove at me, an inhuman scream erupting from his mouth. He pushed me to the floor, and the back of my head struck the tile. Hard. I tried to push him off of me, but he was too strong. He, he raised the knife. You should have taken that stupid teddy bear, he screamed and plunged the knife down. I twisted to the side and raced out of the apartment. I ran until I got to the Walgreens down the street. I didn't have my phone with me, but the worker there could tell I was in shock. She helped me call 911. I, I waited there for the police, and together we went back to the apartment. When we got there, Johnny was gone. He'd taken all his stuff. The only sign that he'd ever been there was his empty dinner plate and the knife that he'd left lying on the floor. It's been two weeks now, and I still haven't heard anything. No one can find Johnny, but I know he's still out there. He's probably still thinking of me, still plotting his revenge. I can't sleep. I can't eat. All I can do is worry that one day Johnny will show up at my door again. I'd forgotten him after first grade, but I'll never forget him now.